All right. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is going to be a um, retrospective of the last the last dance, the Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls uh, uh, documentary that just aired. I, I got my brother here. He's actually on a uh, speakerphone. Uh, Al- Alex, say, say hello to everyone. How you doing? What's going on? Yeah, this is for the, the, the MJ Doc, the, the Jordan Doc, uh, 1990s. Ah, the 90s. Yes. Ah, the early 90s. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, all right, so listen, uh, the, obviously the documentary was, was incredible. Um, I, I'm actually, like, um, surprised at how much attention it's getting. And, uh, yeah, it was very therapeutic. But, you know, j- just from you watching it, what was what, what did you take away from it? Uh, like, what, what, what was the thing that stood out to you the most? Well, well, that's a, that's a great question. And I agree, it was therapeutic and it really was kind of a, a breath of fresh air, you know, with the pandemic going on and not a whole lot of content being out there. Um, you know, I think the thing that stands out overall in the bigger picture is just the reminder of how um, competitive and how disciplined and how cutthroat uh, this guy is. You know, I I mean, I almost, it's almost funny to imagine him, you know, like trying to make a third comeback now. And I know that's not going to happen, but like if anybody like had the balls to do it <laughs> he would do it and I think the whole world would be like oh shit maybe he could come back and win again because he's just so cutthroat he's such a competitor I think that's what stands out to me the most how much how competitive he really is you know no no I, I, I totally agree and it, it's something we've always known but you know you 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 kind of got the feeling that he just um, he looks for any sort of anything just to get him motivated you know even you know we even learned that sometimes he was just making the stuff up with the Le- LeBrafford Smith guy like like uh-huh. apparently like that would have really hurt me too like if the guy said to me sarcastically hey nice game Mike and even though I play like shit like that would have ate me alive but to know that Jordan didn't even do that that he just made it up that, yeah. that lets you know that he just like it like he just like these things drove him crazy even like the BJ Armstrong game when Charlotte beat them, it was kind of like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. It's just one game. You know, sometimes the Bulls lose one game and then they'll just you know, they'll win the next four. But, like, he had, like, the mind of, like, a psycho when they when they were talking about how BJ, you know, carried them to victory in that game. Like, it, it like the little things like that just drove him crazy. Uh, even the thing with George Carl, like, not saying hello to him. Like, he looks for any any little thing just to, to use against you. And... Uh, and honestly, like, that's what you need. I, I think what people don't understand, and I know this mixed feelings, like in terms of, uh, like I have people say to me, oh, you don't play good when you're mad. And then, you know, my dad said to me, you know, you play your best when you're mad. So it's kind of like people have mixed feelings about whether people play better mad. But I really think boxing, I'm sorry, basketball, it's a lot like boxing where you really need to go into that the game with like a chip on your shoulder because sometimes that extra edge uh, just makes the difference. So, so what do you think about that? Well, that's a, I mean, that's a really interesting conversation. I, I, I think it depends on the player. I really, I, I really do. I think it depends on the player. It depends on the team. It depends on the type of moment. I think in the case of Michael Jordan, if he was always looking for an edge that was going to, you know, you know, fuel that anger and, and fuel that fire, that I, that I think so. There's a difference uh, between, you know, using anger and just letting the anger drive you, you know, completely. Um, and so I think that any sort of, if it's sports, if it's music, if it's any type of performance, there's a difference between, you know, basically letting the anger kind of drive everything you do, but then just using it. You've got to be able to channel it and use it the right way, you know? And I think that, that Jordan, you know, the, the more mature Jordan, the, the, the Jordan of the 90s, was able to use it to, to use it the, the right way, you know? No, de- 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 definitely. And I, and I want to I bring up the thing about Kobe, too, because... You know, the, the, he 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 actually mentioned. He said that little Laker dude. He he said he forces the game. He doesn't let the game come to him. I think that's key. Like even though he's like a psycho, 
uh, he, you know, he, he uses, he holds grudges. That's one of the things he holds grudges, but like he, he lets, I think that the message is, even though I hold grudges, I still let the game come to me. And I think, I think that that's the mix of those two is what made him deadly. Yeah. Right. 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 right exactly. And we, you know, it's funny with, with, with the Kobe thing, because we watched Kobe kind of, his career was so different. He, he kind of went in and out of that. It's, it's almost like players like Kobe and Michael, and it's almost like they need this three to five year period at the start of their career to just do whatever the hell they want, you know, and, you know, score the most points, but not bring their team to championships or anything like that. And then when the, when the team, when the time is right, then it's like they have that training period where they basically did everything by themselves. And now they have a good team to back them up. And now they can kind of flip that switch on again whenever they need to. I'm not saying that that's a model. I'm just saying it kind of worked out that way for Jordan. And it kind of sort of worked that way for Kobe twice in his, in his life, in his career, you know? So I, I, I'm just... You know, it's it's kind of interesting if, if you if you look at it that way. You know, they had that because because in the '80s, Jordan. I mean, he did have to do. That's why that's why he's scoring 60 points with the Celtics. I mean, who else is gonna? Nobody else. Is well, gonna, yeah. Well, you, you know, you know, you know what the thing was. That that's an interesting point, and it's kind of it's kind of weird how Kobe tried to do that after the Shaq trade, but you know. The the thing the thing in North, when Jordan was at North Carolina like like he was great and everything but like you didn't really think like this is this guy's gonna set the world on fire this guy can can turn around a franchise and make them a dynasty I don't think anyone thought that so I think when he just got to the Bulls I think he was he I think even he was surprised at how you know no one could really guard him one on one he was able to score as much as he wanted to so I think at that time he, he when you're still trying to prove yourself in the league you're not thinking oh. I'm shooting too much. I need this kind of help. Like it, it, it didn't really hit him. I think until maybe the late '80s, where he started saying to himself, "You know, I, I really need some help." You know, I, I, th- I, th- I think that that whole thing was was just a process. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. I, I, and that that brings up now talking about that that early part of his career. I really love. I mean, looking back on the whole ten part series, I love the give a lot of credit to the, the filmmakers for going to their whole timeline approach. Oh, my God. Starting in ni- going from 98, then going all the way back to, what, 1982, 83, 84, like, just, you know. It was beautif- you know, beautifully done. And, and, and you know what? The, there was even debate about making it a chronological documentary, but they were like, no, we have to start in Montana with Phil Jackson. We're going to do that. So that, how is that going to work? But it, it was beautifully done, you know, I, and it was better than I expected because when you first heard of it, you're like, man, this is only going to be about the last season. But they, 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 they basically covered Jordan's whole, you know, Chicago Bulls career in this whole uh, uh, documentary. So that was a nice treat. I mean, they covered everything. And they, they, and they did it in a beautiful way, too, where, where they, they, they did it where it made sense. And then you would get the backstories of, you know, Pippen, Rodman, Kerr, and Phil Jackson. Everything just, yeah. uh, it, it was just yeah. very, very well done. Yeah, no, it, it, extremely well done. And it really makes you, it, it, the other thing that stands out is just, you know, I, I, I think that I always give the most credit to Phil Jackson because, I mean, he was he was almost able to do this twice. The six, basically the six peat, <laughs> you want to call it that. Right. He almost did it twice with two different teams. Um, but with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, you know, it, it just, it, what stands out is, oh my God, I mean, this, what they accomplished, it's just not fair to put the pressure on any other athlete to accomplish what they accomplished. I mean, they dominated an entire decade, essentially. It, it just, it's not fair to put that pressure on anybody, any other athlete to try and measure up to that. I mean, they just blew it out of the water. Um, and that's why, I mean, you know, jumping to the last episode, basically the last 15 minutes when they they ask him if he would go for seven, and he said, yes, my ma- my jaw kind of dropped. I was like, I can't believe he just said he would have gone for seven because, you know, you have nothing, like, he, he, he walked out on top both times, and he had, he had nothing else to prove. 
and you know he as it is nobody's able to measure up to that and it's but it's it's amazing to hear that competitor say ah yeah i would have gone for seven um but yeah i just in terms of the jordan legacy it might he might be better off not going for seven again the bulls might be better off not going for seven because well, you know what? You know what? Since, since you brought it up, I, I can't resist. I, I, we got to talk about it now. Um, I mean, we, we talk about it all the time. You know, would he, would he, would he have, uh, you know, won a seventh championship in 1999? Um, I just don't know. I mean, th- there was just so many things going on at the time. And, and I, I think more than anything, I just think the lockout. Is, is really what prevented that from happening. But, um, I mean. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I feel, well, well, I think that brings up the, the thing with Jerry Krause, right? I mean, he gets a lot of heat here, you know. But, you know, is the heat for Jerry Krause, is it, do you feel like it's well-deserved when you're looking at the whole? All right. All right. Here, here's, here's, here's my thing about Jerry Krause. Um, you know, I I I think what really caused the most stir was was the book. I mean, you I mean they even covered the book in in some of those Jordan documentaries when we were growing up. You know, they, they it was it was called the Jordan Rules, and 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 he came, he came to Phil, and he he had twenty five quotes that he had a problem with, and I I think that caused the rift uh, more than anything. Um, you know, they they wow. you know they didn't they didn't talk about it in the documentary, but Jordan used to make fun of his weight. He used to call him donuts because he had donut crumbs. Uh, on his, on his, um, you know, <laughs> things like things like that were happening. But uh, but also, what they didn't mention was that um, you know one of the assistant coaches, and I'm assuming the assistant coaches, you know, leaked a lot of this stuff to the journalist uh, to publish the book. You know, went behind you know Jerry Krause's back. Um, so yeah, so that 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 the book really is is the is the main trigger that kind of d- disintegrated this whole group. And, and, you know, they, it was after the second championship that Krause, you know, when, when they were interviewing Krause, he was like, oh, it's a great organization. This is such a great organization from top to bottom. All of that stuff was, you know, when you look back on it, all of that stuff was just him rebelling against the book. And um, so, so definitely that. And they, they fired Johnny Bach. Uh, that was one of the assistant coaches. That was one of Phil's best friends. And Phil kind of, you know, that's what really started, you know, uh, Phil's dissension with Jerry Krause was that firing. So, um, so yeah, you know, th- just things like that happen. Plus, you know, a-, a lot of it, I think, had to do with, with Jordan, too. I think Jordan um, r- always hated Krause. You know, Krause did not draft Jordan. You know, Krause is always bitching about how he didn't want Jordan to play after the foot surgery so they could get a higher draft pick. Uh, so, that, so that started, you know, Jordan's hatred of Krause and vice versa. So I don't think the relationship was ever good uh, because of that. But... Uh, but yeah, wow. man. So 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 when you get to you know when you get to 1998 the, after the sixth championship, um, I, I I I just think at that time you know if um, if Jordan really did want to come back, you know I'm sure Phil and and, and Pippen would have made uh, sacrifices to do it. But the the key thing is you they would have had to uh, you know fire Jerry Krause, you know because Krause wanted to split up the team. He wanted to hire his yeah. fishing buddy Tim Floyd to be the coach. Uh, so in, in that situation, the, the owner just has to get in and just say, hey, you know, you, you know, Krause did a great job of, you know, he drafted Pippen, he drafted Grant, he traded for Cartwright, he had he, he got John Paxson. Uh, so so he did do a good job. But, you know, the, when when you're when you're winning championship after championship, uh, the last thing you want to do is rebuild. I mean, the rebuild sucked. Um, you know, when, when they, when they tried to rebuild, they never made the playoffs. Uh, they fired Jerry Krause in 2003. I mean, the t- they were the worst team in the league in 1999. Um, so, so, you know, he did a terrible job, uh, with the rebuild. Um, so yeah, man, I mean, they, they didn't, they didn't hit the lottery until they got Derrick Rose in 2008. That's when things started fo- finally turning around for them. So that rebuild was definitely not worth it. They, 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 in retrospect, they probably should have tried to go for a seventh championship. And, you know, you could just tell, like, it disgusts Jordan that he didn't try. Like, right. I, I, like th- yeah. that's, that, that's, I kind of got a brain freeze when, when we were started to talk about this, but yeah, like, that's the thing I wanted to say, like, you see how much it drives them crazy, like that they didn't even try for a seventh championship. 
And I, I think, I think LeBron has a lot to do with it too. Like, like everything that's going on with all the attention LeBron got over the years, uh, you, you could just tell, like it, it just, it just eats him alive. The, the fact that he, that, that he, he never even tried, you know. But but then then let's say this let's say he did come back in 1999 with Pippen and Phil um, you know would would losing to the Spurs in the finals uh, eat at him alive you know right what's gonna eat, what, what would eat him alive more losing to the Spurs you know with a with a Bulls team that with that doesn't probably might have not had Rodman right maybe they don't have Rodman you know, well that that, that that that's the thing like. That that Bulls team it, it needed to be seriously revamped because like Ron Harper Rodman they were getting too old at the time and you could just tell like Game Six Jordan had to carry the whole team especially with with Pippen being hurt so um, you know they really really had to reconstruct the team and, and plus Pippen really you know when Pippen went to Houston that year in '99 they they were you know Pippen was definitely not as good you know Barkley blamed Pippen uh, Pippen blamed Barkley that that was a, a terrible situation. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think the, the Bulls would have won in 99 unless they had done some major reconstruction. Plus, you had the lockout going on. And, and with the lockout, people act like, oh, it was only 50 games. But it was like 52 games in three months. Dirk, that was Dirk's rookie year. And he said that the league, the schedule was so chaotic and so fast that he, he, he said that it scared him. And, and he, just, he, he, just had, he said he had an awful time adjusting to the league at that time. Sure. Oh man. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's why I, I. I mean, I'm not taking anybody's side. I just, I just feel like when you, when you look back on it, number seven is a unicorn that Michael Jordan is better off not chasing. You know. I I, I agree. Like but, but but if you're Michael Jordan sitting, if Michael Jordan sitting across from me, he's gonna give me that fucking look. Well, well, well the, the the thing was, you know, in 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 ninety eight, like like Jordan Jordan looked in better shape, like that was his best shape since he got back in, from wow. baseball. Like you could tell, his body looked a lot leaner in ninety seven, ninety eight than even ninety five, ninety six, and yeah. like his fundamental skills were incredible that year. When if you look at some of those games, his footwork. His footwork in 97, 98 was, was like he was constantly doing like, you know, post-up moves, uh, you know, fadeaways, uh, adjusting the pivot foot. It, it was, it's, if you want to learn, you know, the, the best fundamental footwork, watch, watch any clips of Jordan in 97, 98. So, so I mean, he was, he was clearly at the top of his game. The, the, the problem was, I, I, I just don't think that team uh, had anything left. I, I, I really think, yeah, you want to bring Phil back, you know, who knows, maybe maybe, maybe Scotty. You know, Scotty was still good in Portland, but they definitely would have had to revamp that roster uh, if, if, if they wanted Phil to come back w- with the Chicago team. It, it would have took a lot of, it would have, it would have took a lot of, uh, you know, maneuvering. Um, the, the other thing people keep saying is, oh, how come Jordan didn't go to the Knicks in 99? Maybe instead of signing Sprewell, they make a deal somehow to get Jordan. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, I was thinking about that. The, the, there's two thing, two roadblocks in the way of that. Jordan hated Van Gundy because of the, the you know, Van Gundy called him a con artist. And, jo- and uh, Patrick Ewing hated Phil Jackson. So, you know, if, if Jordan did get to the Knicks, you knew that job was going to be Phil's no matter what. But because of Ewing, because of Ewing, it wasn't going to happen. So I, I think that's why I think the Nick thing would have worked because there's so many Nick fans that love Jordan. Like even Spike Lee probably loves Jordan more than Ewing. So oh, yeah. I, I think the Nick thing made a lot of sense. Plus, Jordan was born in Brooklyn. So that would have been really cool. But I kind of understand why it didn't happen. Oh, my God. That would have been monumental. Yeah. And if you're a Nick, I mean, you know, we we became Nick fans. I mean, the 99 Knicks, my favorite team of all time. So, uh, I mean, that would have been cool. But I, I love Sprewell, but, you know, it w- that would have been really interesting to see if Sprewell and Jordan had swapped uh, roles. You know, Alan Houston would have had to come like off the Sprewell bench. Too. He's no Michael Jordan. <laughs> hey, man, hey, they, they still got to the finals, though. But, but yeah, that, that just shows you if, if that Nick team got to the finals, the team that was kind of just thrown together, you know, Ewing came in out of shape because they had a lockout. And Ewing was the, you know, the president of the Players Association, so he wasn't really ready to play. So, you know, who knows? I, I, I mean, I, I, do think, I do think if the Bulls just get to the playoffs, 
you know, Jordan could have found the way to get them to the finals because there really wasn't much in the way of stopping them. I just don't think they would have matched up very well with Duncan and Robinson, especially Duncan. No one could have guarded Duncan at that time. There's really no one they could have put on him. Like even Rodman couldn't have guarded Duncan. And Rodman had, Rodman had no, nothing left in 99. That that stint that Rodman had with the Lakers was kind of a joke. So, so no, I mean, overall, the, the, the thing is, I, I just don't think Jordan would have gotten – uh, a, a seventh championship unless they really revamped that roster uh, in 99. Yeah, they really needed to, you know, put some real love and care into trying to make another championship or continuing the championship run if it means going for a seven, eight, nine, like three to five more years with that aging team. They would have really put, needed to put love and care into it and I think it's a story of Jerry Krause and Phil Jackson not both saying it's time to part ways. Yeah, know? yeah, you know, I, I kind of get the feeling that Phil wanted the break too, but uh, but I, I don't know. I, I I just feel like at that point, you know, Reins, Reinsdorf. I just think he was a he was a. I'm gonna say he's a bad owner. I I, I just th- when you read the book, they say that he 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 was more of a white. He owns the White Sox too. And, and they said that he cared more about the White Sox than the Bulls. And ultimately, that, you know, they, they, they said that was a negative and it really hurt, really hurt the team as far as, uh, you know, the, the ownership goes. But I, I just feel like at that point, you know, if, if, if Krause is causing Pip and Jordan and Phil to have such a headache, you just let him go. You say, you know, you did a great job, but let's just bring in someone that's going to be more conducive with – the philosophy of trying to win now every year. You don't, you know, you know, Kraus, you know, it's weird. It's like, he's like a puppet master. These GMs, they, they, they have such an ego and they, they constantly want to prove that they can, you know, orchestrate a championship team. And they love to start over and rebuild. That's one of the things like they, that's what they love to do is rebuild. But, you know, at, at that, at that point, I, why, why, why do you why do you think that is? Is that a financial? Is it is it does it cost less money to do it that way? Is it well, the, they the, don't have to pay the players as much. Well, I, if, from the owner's standpoint, an owner, the owners love to rebuild because, you know, they, they're they not going to be paying guys max salaries. They're not going to be going over the luxury tax. So that, that's more of an owner's thing. But the GMs just like to do it for the ego. You know, a, a GM is going to say, oh, I built this team. I, I drafted Scottie Pippen. And, you know, give him credit. You know, he, he drafted Pippen when no one knew how, how good he was going to be. You know, P- P- Pippen had amazing talent. Wow. But Jordan, but Jordan really got so much out of Pippen that you know, right. I mean, I'm not saying that Jordan turned Pippen into a superstar, but I definitely think it helped. And you know, Pippen is my all-time favorite player along with Jordan. So, it, it, I mean, the, the fact that he had the mindset to trade for Pippen, it, it does. It makes Jerry Krause a great GM. But I, I, at that point, you still want to keep winning championships. That's the most important thing. You don't bring in a fishing buddy after the guy just won you six championships. Uh, you know, six six championships, six six and zero in the finals. Yeah. <laughs> six and zero. Yeah, well, you know that that makes me think of another great point, which kind of relates to lots of things in life that that I often forget. And I think I even just mentioned this to you a couple of conversations ago about where. You know, it's almost, it's human nature to want to work with the people we're most comfortable with and be in the environments we're most comfortable in. But it's so funny, when I look back on my life, whether it was work or music or whatever I was doing, I I always look back on relationships where I had to work with somebody who I really didn't get along with, who I wouldn't necessarily hang out with, and that was when I was, you know, doing some of my some of my best work, and I always look back and go, hmm, if I could have figured out to continue collaborating with that person, maybe we would have done some really good things together. Because there's something to be said about when there's friction. Sometimes really good things can happen when you have friction with someone, as long as you can keep it from turning into just rage. It, yeah, it just, no, no, that, 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 that's a good point. And I, and I do notice, like, when you have, like, severe issues with someone, 
and they're like they're they're very blunt and they're in your face. Like it, it kind of takes away all that f- the phoniness factor in dealing with people, and you could just get you could just it's like it's all about business. And there's especially like with with professors and teachers too. It's like it's, there's that fear factor. It's like oh man, if I don't get this done, like, I don't feel like dealing with this guy's um, you know shit. So it's it it kind of gets you off your ass, you know. Right. Right. I mean, it's yeah, absolutely. It's great if you if you can strike strike a balance. You know, it, it, it really it really is. I think that's you know why I love Phil Jackson so much. I think he was somebody who was, you know, they call him the Zen master because I think he's somebody he can he can whip you in the shape, but he can calm you down. He can he can criticize you and tell you like, hey, but this is you know, it's not easy. I remember. Um, there was some practice with Pal Gasol. And Pal Gasol, he, he's getting on his case, you know, because he, he couldn't figure out the, how to run the play. And Pal looks at Phil and he says, well, it's not easy. And then Phil looks back at him and says, well, that's why they pay us. You know, <laughs> they, you know, if, if it was easy, they wouldn't pay us. We're professionals. <laughs> and Kobe's on the bleachers, you know, just like he's loving every minute of it. And I thought, wow, that's uh, what, a, what, a, what a great coach, you know, like I well, wish... Phil Jackson. Well, uh, well, uh, you, you know, the, 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 this is this is. I mean, yeah, the, what what Phil did was was incredible because you look at Rodman in San Antonio, and it's like they couldn't control him. Like they didn't they they kept on saying the wrong things to him. You know, he hated Popovich. He hated uh, the other guy. Yeah. I, I I can't remember his name. He's, he's Rodman actually called him Boner, uh, but I can't remember his name. Um, but basically, you know, Rodman was like a train wreck in San Antonio. Even Kraus, he didn't want to bring Rodman in, but someone had the the foresight to 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 know that you know if you bring Rodman into the Bulls, it, it's a perfect compliment to Jordan and Pippen because he respects them. He won't act up the way he did for David Robinson in front of Jordan and Pippen. So that that was smart. But the, I think that you know the the thing the reason why the Rodman thing worked is because Phil. Phil kind of gave him what Isaiah and Detroit gave him, like that. I'm not gonna say you know unconditional love, but you know they he they just knew how to how to connect with them. You know, F- right. F- Phil even said that he reminded him of you know one of the Native Americans in the tribes used to study. Like he used to read all these books about Native Americans, and you know Rodman had an interest in that. So he treated Rodman like he was a friend, like he was a person, and th- that's th- that's what you have to do with Rodman because when when Rodman sees like the NBA as as a business, he loses passion and he he loses like focus. Uh, you know the the reason the thing in, in Detroit works so well for Rodman is because. You know, I, I, Isaiah even said he was a little bit naive to the business of basketball. But, you know, he was at first he was like a, a great person, just willing to learn. But, you know, it, it, as as soon as coaches started get leaving or players started getting traded, you know, he, he totally like it like he took it hard. Like he he looked at it like this was his 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 savior, like this was his new family. And um, yeah. and, and, and once he saw the dirty side to it, like he just he rebelled against it. No, I, I, I really liked I liked that part of the documentary because I, I I could really relate to it and I've met people who have a similar personality like Dennis Rodman and they they do need someone they do need a team like the Bulls and especially a coach like Phil Jackson to be able to understand where they're coming from. I think in 1998 um, when he lets him go to Vegas for a few days or two days just to kind of like let the beast out, you know. But then he doesn't come back. I think. Well, I think Jordan. What a Jordan, and and they end up going to his hotel room to get him out of the, you know, get him out of the hotel room or something like that. Like I love that story. Um, you know. Because- yeah. No. It was. It was funny. Like. Like you never heard anything like that. Like it, it sounds like could have been from a movie. Like Jordan knocks on the on the door, then Carmen Electra is naked underneath the the the, the sheets. <laughs> it's kind of like wow. It's like it's like let's get it. no because you know it, it it lets it lets you know how how bad Jordan wanted to win that last championship and it it, it lets you know it lets you know how bad uh, he he needed Dennis Rodman to win it because he knew that that team that team was on its way out so you needed every every last ounce of of, of Rodman's uh, defense especially in the finals against Malone uh, to win that championship so, so yeah that, that that was cool man. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th- there's so many, so much stuff we we didn't cover yet. Um, I, I b- before I forget, I just want to get your thoughts on, um, you know, out of all the finals teams, 
What, what, what do you think was the best team the Bulls played uh, in the finals? Well, well let, let me, that's a great question. And let me, let me tell you something. And my, my, my gut answer is going to be kind of skewed just because of the last couple episodes. But I have to say, because you, you just mentioned Carl Malone, this makes Carl Malone look like a monster. Those last two have it makes Carl Malone look like a monster. And by the way, I had no idea that um, in the '97 Finals that they tied them, that they won both games in Utah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I had no idea. Well, I, you, I never realized that. Like, oh shit, this actually became a series. Like, I was always under the impression that the Bulls just had it locked in in those finals, and it's not not the case. Um, so I, I, I almost, I, because they went two years in a row and they kind of pushed him to the brink, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I want to say Utah, if they're not number one, they're a close runner up. Well, all right. I, I was thinking about it today and I'll, I'll say this. I, I think the best team the Bulls ran into, especially from an offensive standpoint, is the Suns, the 1993 Suns. Yeah. Barkley was the MVP. Yeah. And, and I'll, t- I'll tell you why. The, the team was already good, but, but adding Barkley, especially after the Olympics, which is a huge deal because Barkley's usually never in shape at the start training camp. But that year he was because of the Olympics. And he led the dream team in scoring. So I, I feel like the Suns team was definitely the best team the Bulls played in the playoffs. But I, I, th- I, think, I think the 97-98 uh, finals... It was probably the toughest on Jordan, though. You know, the 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 flu the uh, the food poisoning game in Utah. That was a serious gut check. I mean, they they really needed to win that game, especially when you're in Utah. The high altitude, the combination of the high altitude and food poisoning, it's um that, that had to be devastating. So yeah, you know, Jordan looked at that as as it was a, a challenge, and now you know the the backstory to it. You you almost you almost get the feeling that. He kind of used the anger from getting poisoned to, um, you know, you know, take it out on the Jazz. But but then when you get to Game Six, like like if, if you look at what Jordan did in that game, just not having a lot of help, you know, Pippen goes down with the back injury. That uh, th- that was probably the uh, that that was probably he had he had to dig down deeper as as far as you know, conservation of energy, you know, timing it out perfectly so he had enough time uh, to finish that game, you know, to make the steal and have the last two field goals in the game. He really had to have the perfect game in terms of just, like, effort on the offensive end. So I, I think I think the, 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 the final game was the toughest for, for Jordan. But I, I still think the, the league, the 1990, in 1992-93, I just feel like that's when the league was at its best – uh, Bill Simmons even made the point. You look at the all NBA teams in 92, 93, and then you compare them to 95, 96. There's a major drop off because of expansion. A lot of the dream team guys started getting older. Uh, I, I'll say this about Stockton and Malone, though. I, I, I think, you know, you give them credit because they were able to maintain you know, they, they were able to, you know, they didn't show any decline uh, going into the late 90s. But Hakeem showed decline. Barkley showed decline. Uh, Clyde Drexler showed decline. Uh, Magic ended up getting sick. So I, I just feel like the, you know, the only reason that the Jazz kept going to the finals was that the, the West uh, just wasn't as good. Yeah, it's like some of the other teams in the West, like uh, Duncan and Kobe, they were a little bit too young at that point. So I, I, I think that's why the Jazz uh, got to back-to-back finals. But I, I don't think that's the best Jazz team, though. Um, like if you, look, if you look at from 88 to 92, they lost to Magic and the Lakers a couple times. And then when you get to the 93 playoffs, they lost to Seattle in the first round. Uh, in 94, the, uh, the Rockets beat them in five games to get to the finals. That wasn't really even that competitive. Uh, then in 96, the Sonics beat them. And then it wasn't until 97, 98 where it's just like, oh, you know, the, the West just isn't as good. We, we kind of had an easier ride to the finals now. And, and, and when, they, when, they, when, when they got there, they beat a Houston team featuring Barkley and Hakeem that you know just, they just weren't in their prime anymore so the point is I, I just I just don't think uh the Jazz were as good as you know Portland in 92 uh or Phoenix in 93 or even Seattle in 96. Well, well I, I think that well two two points I think that 
then my distinction is, no, I, I agree with you. And I, I always agree just watching the games with you, seeing some of the class, the hardcore, uh, the, the, uh, the hard, what's it called? Um, what's it called? Hard, hardcore classics or something like that. <laughs> oh, oh hard, hardwood classics, yeah. Hard, yeah, I definitely could see the level of competition was definitely higher in the early 90s. I, I, could, I could definitely tell. And the, the talent pool was definitely like, whoa, this is really good basketball. I could definitely see that. But I think the distinction I'll make is that it seemed to me, watching this documentary, that the biggest threat might have been that game five, that what we're going to, I'm calling now the food poisoning game, not the flu game, the food poisoning game. That seemed like the biggest threat, and Jordan was able to ward that off and play, you know, and, and, and get that, that always just, which is just amazing. Because if they go back to Chicago, you know, down 3 2, they've never been in that position. They've never Great, been. Where you got to win two in a row. That, that would have been tough, yeah. Yeah, it would have been. It would have been very tough. They have any any team. They could have done it, but what, what, they, they they had never been in that position before. Um, yeah, yeah. R- right, right. If 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 Utah had won that game, uh, you know, P- Portland. I think uh, Portland did tie them at two two. But you know, to, to to be tied at two and still having that 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 game in Utah with, with especially with Jordan being sick, that was a huge yeah. opportunity for for Utah, and they just uh, they, they just couldn't get it done. But uh, but yeah, you know, so some of the other things I just want to touch on, um, you know, I, I know you're more of a rock music fan, but what, what did you think of a lot of the music uh, that was used in the documentary? Like, um, um, oh, I, I mean, it was, it was they used a variety, didn't they? No, no, they, no, they definitely did. Yeah, I thought it was good. I thought some of the early stuff, it made sense, like the late 80s, early 90s, like they were doing some Jordan montages. It sounded like, like early 90s or like late 80s hip-hop, you know, correct? Yeah, no, they, they did LL Cool J and, and Rakim for, you know, a, a lot of the early Jordan stuff. And, uh, you know, when, when they were talking about Jordan's gambling and uh, all the controversy with the book, they 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 kind of showed how how Jordan used uh, you know basketball as an escape to get away from the media, and all of a sudden you you hear the hip hop hooray music, and it, it fits so well because you know when you look back at the '93 playoffs, you know you couldn't go anywhere without hearing you know Naughty by Nature and hip hop hooray, and you know a lot of people are kind of baffled you know you know how white kids start listening to rap, and that's exactly how it started. It's like. You know, the, the rap music is the soundtrack to the NBA, the soundtrack to basketball. So there you go right there. I mean, that the, that's Naughty by Nature, Criss Cross. You know, you, you, heard the, you heard them everywhere at the time. And, you know, the, 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 and that's the reason why, you know, so many kids, uh, you know, bought those albums is because they were playing them at the basketball games. And it just, it just fit very well with, with basketball, those songs. No, I, I, it did really feel like hip-hop and basketball be, became really linked you know, and, and hip hop culture. I remember when Allen Iverson, you know, kind of came up in the late '90s, early 2000s. People were kind of linking hip hop culture to players like him because of the way they dressed and because of the way you know he did his hair. You know, and um, that's it's only natural. It only makes sense. You know, a lot of basketball players are coming. You know, it's a lot for a lot of them, especially Allen Iverson. The rags to riches story. You know, and there, there are a lot of them are coming, not all of them, but a lot of them are coming from the streets. And, you know, hip hop, you know, is, you know, originally from the streets, talking about street life, you know, and typically not always, but typically, you know, African American street life. And so it only makes sense that, you know, it, it be late, hip hop culture be linked with the NBA. Um, in in the '90s and then and then moving forward, I think I think it's great. I do think it's funny that you know I remember in the 2000s the playoffs were super kind of scored by Tom Petty music. Would I love Tom Petty now? But at the time I didn't like Tom Petty, and I was like, why are why are why are the NBA playoffs? Why are we hearing "Running Down a Dream" by Tom Petty before every commercial break? It's just weird, you know. I don't. When I well, I, I'll tell you, Pet, Petty had a lot of stuff that went well with the NBA. You know, learning to fly with the Bulls' first championship video. He, they used his song for that for that video. So I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was. It's not always hip hop. I mean, if if it fits well, I I, th- I think I think they used one of the songs, uh, "The New King in Town." 
Uh, I don't remember who did the song, but they used that for like, you know, Jordan when he was dominating in 1988. Okay. Oh, oh really? Oh, that was, was that a, was that hip hop? No, no, it wasn't. It, it was like a, um, it was, it was more of a pop rock uh, song, but I, I'm not sure, I'm not okay. sure who did it. Um, sure. I, you know, to, to be perfectly honest, the music really didn't phase me or even, I didn't really think about the music watching this documentary. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it didn't, I think the, the early 90s, late 80s hip hop stuff took me out of it just for like a split second. Like, oh, wow, that's, <laughs> oh, okay. that's dated. You know, like yeah. those sounds are so dated to me. But, but I'm not, not dated in a bad way. Just but no, well, I, I liked it though because they, they, they use rap songs that were popular in 93 or, you know, they, they use uh, KRS One, Step Into a World. Uh, in um you know for the 95 96 bulls it's like step into a world like you never seen anything like this 72 and 10 uh yeah. even though you know that didn't come out the same year it came out in the middle of that run so i i thought that worked really well plus you know everything was east coast west coast related and, and that was a good that was a good pick because it didn't really it wasn't california love or you know anything from biggie right. so you know you know what i'm saying there right. so yeah I, I thought the music was well done but um yeah, I, I, the, the other important thing is what, what's really, you know, what really made this like a great story, is, especially for casual fans, is, you know, getting burned out from the media and the Olympics and the gambling in 92, 93, not having anything to prove, you know, going to play yeah. baseball, you know, um, you know, t t totally like rechanging his body to, to, to play baseball. You know, baseball is really hard. It's a lot harder than, than you know, he expected. Uh, Sports Illustrated yeah. even said, you know, bag it, Michael. You know, there was a lot of backlash um, on Jordan in terms of, you know, actually going to play baseball. Some people thought he was, the, I guess the Sports Illustrated guy said he was delusional. So it was interesting to see all the, um, the, the critics in terms of the baseball. But then, you know, who knows? You know, maybe if it wasn't for the strike, he would have kept on playing. But there was a strike in 94, going into spring training in 95. I think I think it was because of the replacement players issue. That's what caused Jordan to quit, and uh, you know he just decided to come yeah. back. Uh, but 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 how how fascinating was the going to play baseball and then coming back and then losing? That, uh, how fascinating was that? It, it really made for a great story. It did. You know, it gave this kind of Goliath athlete. You know, um, well, I'll start from the end. Losing to the Magic gave him probably the, the edge, the biggest edge that he needed, you know, because he, he, he climbed to the top. He, he did something that Bird and Magic didn't do by winning three in a row, and he needed that. But before that, I really thought that was kind of a breath of fresh air, even as a viewer, for him to go and play baseball. And you see him in the, in the locker room just having a good time and, you know, watching him kind of, you know, essentially, in the eyes of, of us, in the eyes of the world, kind of allow himself to fail again. You know, it's very important to, you know, allow yourself to, to fail again, not in a bad way, but in a good way. And, and to hear professional, like, baseball coaches and people say that, you know, if he had 1,500 at-bats, they think he would have gone to the majors. I'd like to hear, like, you know, modern-day baseball serious baseball fans and players kind of I'd like to get their take on that because it'd be because you know it's always you know when you hear like when you hear Joe when you talk to someone like Joe Rogan about guys from pro wrestling trying to go into UFC he immediately gets critical like right away like oh that's not the same thing you know so it'd be interesting to hear you know, a, a real baseball guy's take on like do you think he actually could have eventually made the majors you know, um, it would have been interesting to hear that. But even but that aside, I just, I respect that. It's very, very difficult to be successful in one arena, in sports or entertainment. It's, a, it's just monumentally difficult to do the Bo Jackson thing <laughs> and be successful in, in, or the Brock Lesnar thing and be successful in two different arenas. Right, very, right. Very hard. Yeah, I mean, no. basically, Jordan going to play baseball it was kind of like Brock going to play football. It, it, it was like, you know, you give them credit for trying, but ultimately, it, it just didn't work out. But, we, you know, what I love about the baseball thing is, 
you know, he, he, he did mention that it was, it was, a, it was therapeutic because his father always wanted him to play baseball. It was like, he was like, yeah. he was living for his father's dream. I think the father wanted him to retire after the first championship and play baseball. So that, um, I, 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 I remember hearing that, but, but, you know, Jordan thought that was too soon, but I, I think what, what playing baseball did was, you know, the game was, uh, he said the game was getting too commercialized in 93 that it started to take away a lot of the passion and, and b- baseball really, it really brought him back to, you know, the, the work ethic and what you have to do to really, uh, the, you know, the, the baby steps that you have to do to, to improve. And, uh, I, I think it was the best thing for him. You know, it, it, I, th- I think playing baseball and, and then losing to the magic in the playoffs, it was, it was just a nice slap in the face of, Hey, you know, you're not, you know, you're, you're great, but you know, let's, let's not forget the most important thing is you got to put the work in It's the work ethic more than anything else uh, that, that got you to where, where you were as Michael Jordan. So that, that's what I loved about that. But um, you know, the, when he came back in 95 though, like he was still good though. Like, you know, he, he had some bad games. Like he didn't look great when he first came back, but like, he still had some, you know, monumental performances, though. He had 55 against the Knicks. He pretty much destroyed, you know, Larry Johnson and Alonzo Mourning and the Hornets in the first round. But, you know, when he ran into, when he went, ran into Orlando, though, you know, he, he just couldn't, he just wasn't as, um, you know, game in and game out. He just, he just wasn't consistent, though. And, and you could definitely tell he just wasn't quite in basketball shape. You know, he had to change his body a lot. You could just tell, like, you know, it's just you just can't you can't turn it on and turn it off no matter who you are. And that, that's the message it sent to me. And and, and and you could just tell, like losing to the magic, it, it just ate at him. Like you, 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 you could tell, like he couldn't wait to get back the next season. And it, it just brought back the eye of the tiger and then bang, you know, a 72 and 10. But, but let's not forget that the reason the Bulls weren't as good that year is they didn't have Rodman. They didn't have Horace Grant. So the other thing was it really it really put a tremendous amount of value on that spot. I mean, wouldn't would you agree with that? Yeah, you're kind of like the fourth, the third or fourth man, you know, sort of you're, you're the guy who does the dirty work, the one who's, you know, and, and I think all around, you would probably agree Horace Grant was a better player than Rodman, but if you just needed somebody to ground and pound and do all the dirty work, Rodman's everybody's guy. Well, know, I mean, you want to hear Rodman. something interesting. J- Jordan said that the second three-peat doesn't, does, does not happen with Horace Grant, he said that he, he he just wasn't mentally tough enough. Uh, so that that was Jordan's take on it. But hey, you know, I give Horace Grant credit. You know, wow. he 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 had a great run with the Magic. So so I I, I still thought he was a tremendous player. But you know, I, I would agree with that. I I I think Rodman had a certain level of toughness uh, that that Horace did not have. Uh, to be honest with you. And uh, yeah, it, it seemed like Jordan really holds a grudge against Horace Grant. He kind of uses him as a scapegoat for all the dirty stuff that came out about the book. Uh, there, I mean, we talk about Jordan being hard on the teammates, being an asshole. He actually, um, they didn't talk about this in the documentary, but it was one game Horace played like shit against the Pistons and, and Jordan actually took his play, his food on the plane and just threw it out. And he said, Horace, you know, you, you, you didn't play well enough to eat. So that, that was kind of like the most prickish thing Jordan's ever done. But, you know, I, 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 I think it was a good move. And I, I, I think, you know, the feeling of, you know, not eating or, or, or you know, someone taking something away from you, it, it teaches you a valuable lesson in terms of all oh, like, I'll never make that mistake again. Um, and I, I've even gone through it too. I, I remember the the times where I felt so depressed, where you weren't able to eat. So it, it, it really it really gives you that feeling of man, I don't ever want to feel this way again. It, it, it and it teaches you a valuable lesson. So I just think, you know, thing, you know, Jordan being tough on his teammates, it really kind of um, it rubbed off on them in a good way. I felt. Sure, sure. Yeah, this is why I don't play sports. I love to eat so much, whether I do well at something or I suck. I'm having my beer and my bean and cheese burrito. There's just, you're not going to stop me from having my beer and my bean and cheese burrito. Just a side note. This is why I'm not successful in sports. That's why I don't play sports. Um, <laughs> but, no, um, wow. Man, that's, that's a crazy story. I, and, you know, that, that the other thing that stands out from this documentary for me is 
man, these bites from Jordan are just <laughs> off the wall, off the charts. I mean, I, I want to talk, a little, guys, I just wanted to mention, like, when they're showing him, just as an example, and there are a lot of good examples of this, but when they show him the iPad, every time they show him the iPad, his reaction is just priceless. But my, I think my favorite one, um, the Gary Payton one is a close runner-up, but my favorite one is when they show the, the clip of Reggie and him locking horns like in the early 90s, so, you know? And <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, don't, he's like, don't let him go. Don't let him go. No, 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 he's like, let him go. Let him, yeah, yeah. Let him go. And he looks, he gives the iPad up, he looks at the interviewer like, he's, all, he's, he's right back in it. Like, he's right back in the fight. I'm like, oh my God, this guy doesn't, you know, like, that was just really great filmmaking because we all know what that's like if you see the clip of your you know like just just in that moment <laughs> you know and that's somebody that he respects i mean obviously before the press conferences he he and reggie would shake hands or they'd give each other a, you know a bump and say you know you know it's it's going to be a dog fight you know this or that <laughs> but he's just like th that clip is just like whoa this guy Yeah, he, you know, you could tell he, he craves competition. Like it was, you could tell like his eyes are just getting big looking at that Reggie. Th Reggie just like pushes him for no reason. Like Reggie was just crazy back then. Like I, I, I've never seen anything like I. I don't think anyone could get into his zone like Reggie Miller. You know what he did against the Knicks, and you know he gave he gave Jordan a tough time too. And you know jo Jordan actually was very complimentary to the Indiana team to, to say that they were a bigger threat than the Knicks. It was a big slap in the face to to Nick fans, but it, it's true that 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 Indiana game seven, when when they won the seventh game, that's the most oh, relief yeah. I've ever seen. Jordan. He looked so happy after they won that game. He, I, that was a nerve wracking game. You know, if if, if you look at Jordan yeah. before and then you look at some of the behind the scenes stuff after it, you could just tell it was a huge weight lifted off his shoulder, and it was almost like they knew that it was almost like he knew he was going to win the finals once he got past that game. Right, because I, I think that, yeah, I mean, even said in the documentary, a lot of credit to that Indiana Pacer team, right? I mean, they almost, maybe, almost closer than they came close than anybody, except for maybe, what, the 90, was it the 92 Knicks or the 90, 93 Knicks? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 only, the only two times the Bulls got taken to a Game 7 during the championship years was uh, the 92 Knicks. We, we, I mean, we actually went to Game 6 of that series, um, in in New York, and then uh, and then and then 1998 Eastern Conference Finals against the Pacers. That's the only two times they were pushed to a Game Seven, you know, during the uh, the championship years. But but yeah, no no, I I do agree with you though. I, I do want to get back to the Jordan's reactions. Yeah, the the thing with Reggie when he when he's when he's looking at the fight that that was great. Uh, I, and I, I love the reaction to Gary Payton when Payton was like, w once I started guarding Jordan, it changed the whole series. And then Jordan looks at it, he's like, really? <laughs> he's like, he was like, it looked like it was pissing him off. But I'll tell you that the Sonic series, the Sonic series pissed me off because you can't get down three nothing, especially to that team, and expect to have a chance. You know, I'll give Payton credit. You know, Jordan did not have a good series uh, after the third game, but. You know, I they they blamed it on tendonitis. You know, Jordan blamed it on tendonitis. He he actually was in a lot of pain. You know, he was still carrying a lot of weight from the baseball training, so he wasn't really like you know, it, it, like I said, he wasn't really in basketball tip top form quite yet. So I think that had more than anything to do with it. Plus, uh, you know, the, the reason why Peyton didn't guard him at first is because he had a calf strain. So they were trying to you know they were trying to to minimize his um, minimize him on defense, but. In retrospect, it was a mistake. You, you got to put the best defensive player. I think Peyton was the defensive player of the year that year. So you, you got to put him on Jordan oh, there. That was a really disappointing finals, I, I thought. Uh, yeah. you, some people even thought that Rodman could have won the MVP in that series. Because uh, he, he had such a great wow. finals, yeah. But uh, but yeah, wow. but 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 yeah, but yeah. Back to the reactions too, man. Uh, the, the Isaiah, th I forgot to talk about the Isaiah thing. Uh, oh, you could yeah. you could tell you really. I, I would say this out of anybody, 
the guy that he hates the most out of all of his rivals is Isaiah. You could tell there's still a lot of bad blood there. You could you could tell you know wow. they, they didn't mention the freeze out game. I don't I I don't know why the All Star game where Jordan felt like he was froze out. Um, but yeah, you know I you know his reaction to Isaiah. You know the 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 thing that Isaiah got criticized about was being a phony. Like he says, like knowing what we know now, I say, hey man, I'll shake your hand. Good game, man. Good game, man. Oh, good game. And it, it, I don't know. It just he do, does doesn't he just come off like a like a phony to you? Like I, I wish Isaiah just told the truth. Why didn't you just tell the truth? What is what is the best version of the truth? All right, all right. The truth is the, the truth is this, and this would make a lot of sense to me. You know, they, that was the first year that the NBA was on NBC. You know, they 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 tried to clean up the game a little bit, and 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 Jordan was doing an interview, and he said that you know the the Pistons are just not you know we want to see clean basketball, and he he said that the Pistons just are not good for the game, and the interview got back to Isaiah and Lambeer. And that's when they made the decision just to walk right past them and just uh, not shake hands. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think if Isaiah came clean and said, hey, this is the reason why I, I, I felt disrespected by Jordan, so I didn't want to shake his hands because of those comments. Right. And, and you know, to, to be honest with you, I blame, the person I blame, well, I do blame last year. He was a bully. On that team. He's such an asshole. He didn't care, though. Yeah. And if you, you know, honestly, if you, um, remember the Bad Boys documentary, um, the Bad Boys 30 for 30, he has no regret. He did, like, when they asked him about it, he said he would do, I think he said he would do the exact same thing. And I kind of blame him more than anybody else. And then you, you, you look at Isaiah, and you, you have to say to, to Isaiah, you know what? You, he really wasn't as much of a leader as, you know, a Michael Jordan or a Larry Bird, any of those guys. If you're going to let your center or your center or power forward come up to you and say, hey, let's just walk out, and you just listen to him, you should have the maturity to be able to look up and say... Well, no, you know, the, the, he, he's using... I, I'm not saying that Lambeer didn't do it, but Isaiah is using Lambeer as, as a scapegoat there. I, I feel like... It goes a lot deeper than that. I, I, I think deep down inside, Isaiah, there's a lot of jealousy there. Let's face it. I, Isaiah has this mentality that if you didn't grow up in Chicago, you don't deserve to play for Chicago. And he, he, I feel like he used that against Jordan a, a lot. And I, I think that's part of the reason why you had the freeze out. And, you know, I, I, just, I, just, I think at that time, it just looked really bad. You know, they, he was trying to say that Bird walked off the court. Bill Simmons explained that back at that time, the fans used to rush the court. So for safety reasons, you had to try to get out as soon as you can before all the chaos happened. But when, when Isaiah did it, the fact that he walks right past him and then he ducks as he's walking by Jordan, it's just not a good look. It, it just made him look like a coward. And, you know, it, I, and I don't think Jordan left him off the dream team. I think they, I think they knew Jordan didn't really want to play. You know, he, he loves to play golf. It's a long season. I think they knew. We present him with the fact that Isaiah is not going to play. It's a much easier sell. And plus, sure. plus they're, they're making the move to NBC. They don't want the Pistons in the finals anymore. They could give a fuck about Isaiah. So they, they didn't care. I, 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 I really, I really think. Uh, David Stern, I really think David Stern, Dick Ebersol, maybe it was Rod Thorne, whoever was putting that team together, they they made the decision. Jordan even said in the Dream Team documentary that it was presented to him before they even put the team together that Isaiah wasn't going to be part of the team and it was coming from higher places. So that's all you need to know. I, I don't think Jordan, I don't think Jordan ever said, hey, listen, you, you leave Isaiah off the team, I'm, I'm in. I think Jordan looked at the roster and said, all right, this is the team, I'm in. Right, right, but maybe, right, exactly. I don't think Jordan should get all the blame. It, it sounds like... I mean, he had beef with half the team, including... People forget Carl Malone hated uh, Isaiah. You know, Carl Malone hated Isaiah so much, he gave him 48 stitches. Uh, he hate, uh, Him and Magic were ha having some ups and downs about the whole uh, HIV situation and how Magic got AIDS. He had the whole racism thing with Bird. 
uh, Pippin hated him because Pippin always heard Isaiah saying, knock him on his ass, man, knock him on his ass. Don't let him have a layup, knock him on his ass. So Isaiah would always, you know, he's the one that really kind of instigated all the, you know, that whole bad boy image, you know. Okay, I see. Yeah, I see. No, I and uh, you know, then I oh, look. I agree with it. You know, they were a good team. Look, they went to the finals three times. The, the Pistons. They they won two in a row. Um, and you know, the, the Bulls get the the Bulls got past them. And my I guess you know my conclusion from all of that is that it's not Michael Jordan the man that leaves Isaiah off the team. It's Michael Jordan's influence. And whether Jordan you know pulled any levers or not. If 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 you're if it's the choice between Michael Jordan and Isaiah Thomas, you're gonna take Michael Jordan. They, you know, you want Jordan on that team. I mean, they, they didn't they have Michael? Didn't they have like McDonald's like the commercials and sponsorships and all that sort of stuff? I mean, there was a lot of money. Oh man, and, that. and and that's the thing. And, and maybe we could tie this into Pippen now. I mean, the the, the dream team and and the Bulls winning championships. It skyrocketed the revenues in the league to the point where, you know, Pippen signed his deal before all of that happened. If Pippen had just waited, you know, he could have made a lot more money. But, you know, uh, Pippen um, was worried about his injuries and, and, and he wanted to take care of his mother and his family. So so that's the reason he signed such an early deal. But it, 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 the, the deal just became laughable the more and more as time went on because, you know, the league, the, let's face it, the league took off because of the dream team in Jordan. So, uh, so that, that had a lot to do with that. But, um, you know, in terms of Isaiah though, the, I don't want to take anything away from those teams. I think Isaiah is a, a great point guard. I, it's amazing how many championships they won because I, Isaiah didn't really play with another hall of, I, I guess Rodman, uh, Rodman ended up being a hall of famer, but you know, it, it it was a great collection of um you know yeah. players it, it wasn't like it wasn't like he was playing with James Worthy or Kareem or or Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish you know I, I, Isaiah really got a lot out of that that group in terms of being the leader so uh, the, the the Detroit teams really taught the Bulls a lot of lessons and you know just losing to them it like that that when yeah. Pippen had the migraine headache I think that extra loss really hit them hard and it, it really you know they started hitting the weights and it was it was a huge wake up call for everyone including Jordan and uh I I I I think uh I think the Pistons made them better and 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 Jordan's always very complimentary to the the Pistons in terms of you know that that's the team where you know they taught taught him so many lessons that it, they yeah. they made them better exactly Absolutely. He had to hit the weights just to do it. I mean, if he doesn't go through that, maybe he doesn't have the run that he has. Maybe the, the Bulls don't have the run that, the, that, that they have. You, know, you never know, you know, because all of that, all of that punishment that they dealt with, that forces him to go and put on weight and forces, you know, the, the rest of the team to go and, you know, hit the weights. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 pist- the thing with the Pistons, it, it, uh, it, it really... I'm not going to agree with Isaiah fully in, in terms of, oh, they're the reason the Bulls became the Bulls. But no, it, it, no. it, it honestly, it, 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 did, it did force them to make a lot of decisions. And the biggest decision is Phil Jackson. The, the, I'll tell you, Doug Collins, when Doug Collins was the coach, what sealed his fate was when Jordan made the game-winning shot in Game 3 in 89. When when he said, you know, that was Michael, I, the, the play, the play was get the ball to Michael, everyone get the fuck out of the way like that. That sealed his fate the, to Jerry Krause. Jerry Krause was like, all right, this is not a one man show. He started looking at Tex Winter and what was going on with Phil Jackson about how they needed to involve more of the teammates with the triangle. And so if it wasn't for that, you know, you know, who knows what would have happened. And, and that that's why they brought in Phil probably a lot sooner than later. Right. Right. I'm glad you brought up Doug Collins. I think that's one place where I wish, and I, and I love this documentary. I think they did a, an amazing job, but I do think that there's there was a little bit of unspoken stuff from from Doug Collins. Well, yeah, it, they, yeah. He he seemed like he didn't want to go into specifics. He just goes like, Phil could have been the coach then. You can just tell he's very emotional. You can tell he's very emotional about it. He's an emotional guy, but I love Doug Collins though. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever explained the game better than Doug Collins, maybe Ubi Brown. Uh, but, you know, as a basketball coach, though, it seemed to me like 
he 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 didn't realize that that you you know you couldn't keep the ball in Jordan's hands the whole game. Yeah, you, you had to get help from the other teammates, and for whatever reason, he was unwilling to uh, adopt to the triangle. Right, right. Yeah, he didn't want to do it. That's the, the that's the, the direction that, that Jerry Krause want, wanted to go in, and it was I mean it was the right decision in the long run. It really was the right decision. Maybe you get one or two championships with a Doug Collins, but you don't get six. You know what I mean? I think that that really. That's kind of the other thing that stands out is in the big picture of things, all these decisions that get made leads to this almost mega dynasty. You know, it just right. feels it's like, wow, you know, like this, this is a, a, a giant accomplishment to win six championships in, in eight years. And if, if, you, if you keep the dog talk, because Jordan said in the documentary, they, they really did a good job of getting Jordan to kind of give you his mindset not only now, but at that time, he would have been fine with Doug Collins for the next... Oh, he, he loved Doug Collins. Yeah, he actually hired him in, in Washington with the Wizards when he went to play. <laughs> Well, that, that 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 that's what you learn about Jordan. He he's not he doesn't he doesn't trust a lot of people, which is why he didn't want to play for another coach. With, with LeBron, it's like LeBron doesn't give a fuck. It's like he he's he knows he has more power than the coach. So whether it's Frank Go, Frank Vogel, Eric Spolstra, David Blatt, Teron Lou, he doesn't care. Uh, but but at, back at that time, it was just different. Like J- Jordan did not want to trust another coach, especially Jerry Krause's uh, fishing buddy. So. Um, so, so so you know, but uh, but 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 the important what the important thing about the about Phil though and the triangle was with the Pistons it was like the, you had the Jordan rules, you know we finally learned exactly what the Jordan rules were how he was so predictable to guard, but the the great thing about the triangle for Jordan was it, it minimized the double teams because you constantly had guys cutting, uh, you, you couldn't totally commit a double team to Jordan because you had guys cutting that are wide open so. The triangle was really beneficial to Jordan in terms of just limiting how you can defend him. And I think that's what made Jordan and even Kobe, you know, so good during those triangle years. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and I, I don't know. You just you got me thinking about LeBron. I, I think, you know, this, this could be a crazy statement, but I, I, I think Frank Vogel could end up being the best coach that LeBron James has ever had. Um, you know, you know, you can argue with me on that if you want, but, but yeah, no, it's. I think that's one of the reasons because I, I like LeBron. I root for LeBron. I can't help it. I just think he's, he's fun to watch. Right, right. Um, but you, his career has just been such a. In the finals, he's just like, oh man, you know, he's only gotten three and he's lost what six, you know, so you know five or six. So it's like, it's like, whoa, it's rough. It's rough to watch. Uh, it's hard. To be a LeBron, it's it's a lot harder to be a LeBron fan, you know, because he's he's had so much heartbreak in those those big moments. Um, but he's never had a Phil Jackson. He's never had uh, a Hall of Fame coach. He's had yeah, I mean, Teron Lou and, and um, who was the guy in Miami? Was it me? Oh, guy? oh, a, a, Eric Spolster. Eric Spolster. I mean, he was you know the, the, nothing against video editors, but you know he came from the video editing. <laughs> he did the co- yeah. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure he was fine, but it was just like one of those things where it's like, this is not a Hall of Fame coach. This isn't like a Greg Popovich. Well, well, well you know, I, I like Spolster because he's he's a disciple of Riley. But but I think the important thing is, I just think things have changed now. Where you know the 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 power, the coaches do not have as much power as, as they used to have, especially with the GMs. Uh-huh. Uh, getting more and more power, and you know the Le- obviously the players have a lot more power now uh, than ever, and and LeBron James is uh, the poster boy for that. But 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 Alex, you know, um, may- but we'll wrap it up with uh, in five minutes right here. I I, I just want to um, touch on some things that that we didn't cover yet, and and you could follow up on uh, on some of this. I'm just going to read off some stuff here. Um, I, so as far as some of the interviews, the the interviews are great though. I, I was surprised that he he. This guy actually got as many, you know, sound bites as he did. I mean, there really wasn't many. But some of the guys that I thought could have uh, participated that didn't were Clyde Drexler, uh, Juanita Jordan, Jordan's wife. I understand why, but it would have been cool to to get her in there because she was a huge part of Jordan's uh, uh, legacy. Uh, Shaq. Is his current wife or his ex-wife? No, no, his ex-wife. I think, yeah, I think... um... 
I, maybe maybe it's better to keep the ex-wife out of there. You know? Yeah, yeah, we know. We've been through that. All right, so yeah, we, we could... Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, and then, and then we got Shaq. Shaq and Penny. I really thought Shaq and Penny could have been a part of the documentary, especially in the Orlando thing. They really just used Horace Grant. You know, Horace Grant didn't even play in the 96 playoffs. I think he was hurt uh, when, when they swept the Magic in 96. So it would have been nice to have Shaq and Penny as part of the documentary. I, I don't need Shaq. I think Penny, but yeah, I don't need, I don't need Shaq. Well, I, like, we beat Michael. You know, we're, we're one of the only teams to beat Michael. And that's that. So I, I don't need to hear that. Yeah, I know you asked me about Michael Jordan, man. I don't know about that. What's he, he going to say? But Penny, yes. Penny, yes. <laughs> Well, Penny, I mean, you, you give Penny credit. He was, he was, you know, Shaq and Penny were the best players on the only team to eliminate Jordan from 91 to 98. So I think, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't know. But, hey, you know, they probably didn't have much to say. Plus, you had Horace Grant there speaking for them. So it's all good. Um, all right, all right. The Bulls did – the other thing is I feel like the Bulls did have a lot of luck, though, in terms of the actual finals. Um, now let, let me go through this chronologically. When they played the Lakers, uh, James Worthy, Magic was even saying last night that James Worthy hurt his ankle against Portland, and he wasn't the same during the finals. I think Byron Scott might have been injured as well. So that's number two and number three on the Lakers not playing once they got to L.A. Uh, Also, uh, Phoenix. Phoenix did not have Cedric Sabalas in the finals. I always forget about that, but Cedric was like, he was the slam dunk champion in 92. Uh, probably besides Barkley, KJ, and Marley, probably the fourth best player on that team. Uh, Gary Payton had an injury going into the finals, uh, which is why he didn't guard Jordan in the first three games. So they got lucky about that. Uh, I think the Jazz weren't injured at all. Uh, so, yeah, bottom line is uh, someone actually brought this to my attention. The, the Bulls definitely had a lot of luck. The Horace Grant injury, too, in 96. So they, they definitely did have a lot of luck uh, in, in, in terms of the, uh, the injuries. Well, I mean, that's, that's always been a big part of the game. And we've seen that in recent history, too, with, you know, you know mul- multiple teams, you know, getting into the finals or sometimes it's not sometimes it's not uh it's not an injury it could be a suspension because somebody gets off the bench during a fight or something like that and that changes the course of a series you know i mean it really you i I know you, you can call it luck but at the same time a big part of you know having that consistent success is just staying consistent staying healthy and taking advantage of when other teams are not healthy it's like when you go into it's like when i you know good to bring up pro wrestling you know like it's like when you know a wrestler has an injured knee you got to work on the knee and you go of course you're going to work on the knee you know it's like you are in a boxing match if uh you know a guy has a you know a bad eye you kind of have to throw your jabs at that bad eye because you know that that's going to, that's a weak point. It's a, it sounds like a horrible thing to say, but it's a competition. And in this case, these guys that are they're out with their, these injuries, the James Worthy is, that's like, whoa. He's a yeah, now that, fan. yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's a big loss. Greatest of all time, that's a giant loss. I think that that, that game, that might go six or seven. If you have James Worthy. Oh, definitely. And, and and when you look back at the Magic Jordan thing, like they, it's it's that had such hype going into it at the time. But you just feel like that could have been so much more had they met in their, yeah. you know, when Magic was still healthy. And you kind of feel bad that Magic ended up getting the HIV shortly after that. But you know, it is it is what it is. But but yeah, j- just to wrap it up, there, there's two things that I just want to talk about before we wrap it up. Uh, the Scotty, you know, Scotty Pippen being the uh, All Star Game MVP in 1994. That's his uh, first year there without Jordan. If it wasn't for Hakeem, he would have been the MV- MVP that year. You have that whole thing with Ku coach in the last shot. Uh, h- h- how do you think Pippen came off there in terms of saying that he doesn't regret uh, walking out of that game because he was upset that Ku coach had the last? Uh, you know, that Phil Jackson threw, drew up the play for Ku coach to get the last shot. What, what's your takes on uh, on Scotty there? How, how did he? How did he look in this? How did he look in this documentary? And it's, it also, in terms of him putting off the surgery uh, during the season too, like, how, what were your overall feelings of uh, how Scotty was portrayed uh, in the documentary? That's a good question. I, you know, it, it feels to me like almost in the interviews, like Scotty doesn't say a whole lot. 
And they, because there were times where it felt like I was waiting for like Scotty to, to like have a reaction to what a, a Jordan or a Phil Jackson was saying. And it just didn't come. Or if it came, it was just, it was very little. Like he would just, I don't, I'm not sure he really said a whole bunch. You know, I think he could have said a whole lot more. They just didn't use as much. Um, as far as the crew coach thing, I mean, no, I think that's a that's a point. He obviously he apologized to the team, but you know the fact that he looks back in retrospect and he doesn't regret it. I think that there was he was really trying to be the guy. You know, Jordan leaves. He's underpaid. He's trying to prove a lot. No, he's the best player. I mean, he's the best player in the game uh, in in terms of basketball skills. I mean, if you watch the All Star Game that year, he was he was he was he he was by far the best player on that court. So I I, I totally understand it. However, though, if we're going to talk about this in a basketball sense, and I, I've talked to Jason Curry about this when I, when we talked to Jason about it, he actually took Ku Coach's side and he took Phil Jackson's side. He said he would, he said a coach would know in practice if you can make that shot or not. Phil clearly knew that that wasn't Pippen's shot, and I agree in terms of that shot. Yeah. Ku coach catches the ball, 1.8 seconds left, fading to the left. And, you know, that's Ku coach's shot. Is Pippen is not a catch and shoot guy with the game on the line. That, 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 that's just not his shot. But that's not to take away that Pippen wasn't the best player in the game. It's just a tough, tough situation. And, um, you know, I, I would agree, though, like if, if Jordan was in that position and they chose Ku coach over Jordan, you knew it would have drove Jordan crazy. But, you know, it was, I was kind of baffled that Jordan said, Scotty knows better. Scotty knows better. But how would Jordan react in that situation? I don't think he would have took it very well. But, 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 but Scotty, that's, that's the thing. That's the thing. Scotty is not Jordan. As good as Scotty is, Scotty is not, is not Jordan. And Jordan has made those, made those shots, you know. Um, you know, I think that you don't give Pau Gasol the ball, the, 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 that shot. You don't give, I wouldn't even necessarily give Carl Malone or Patrick Ewing that shot the same way. No, I would, Scotty. Well, would yeah, and, and plus the back of that, so, yeah, you know, you got to go with, no. you know, you, you got to go with the guy that's a, that's a deep shooter. I mean, Ku Coach was a great yeah. shooter. Um, but, but you know, the, this. I'll go, I'll go with Paxson. Paxson's still on the team in 94. I'm going with Ku Coach and yeah. Paxson. But I'll tell you what, though, Ku, Ku Coach was tailor made for that, those catch and shoot types of finishes, though. So I, I, it really is, it really was a good call. But at the same time, you know, you got the arguably the best player in the league, you know, asking him to take the ball out of bounds. It, it, that, that's a tough spot to be in. And, and what makes it even tougher is the backstory. You know, the, you know, Jerry, Jerry Krause was putting aside cap space, putting aside money to sign Ku Coach. Before you know, while the Bulls were winning championships, so he made it more of a priority to, to pay Ku coach than Pippen. And then, yeah. as soon as Ku coach comes to the Bulls, he's making more money than Pippen, who's already a three time right. champion. It just doesn't feel right, and you know, oh, it goes right. a lot deeper than that. But I'll, I'll give yeah. Pippen credit though, he he didn't he didn't hold it against Ku coach. Eventually, you know, Pippen is a nice guy, Ku coach is a nice guy. Eventually, they became really good friends, but at that time, he, he's you take you're taking money out of a champion's wallet you're preventing it you're preventing the best player in the game from you know taking care of his family to the maximum degree and so it goes a lot deeper than you know just you know uh, the ku coach was you know you know giving ku coach a final shot what's crazy is that though by doing that and i do i do think pippen deserved to get paid you know what those other players in his type of spot were getting paid but what's crazy is that you know by and I, and, I, and I said this about you know I, I think it's similar with um, that's why for years I was like Stephen Curry's not making you know the max good good have him take like as little as he can because then nah, I'm not a huge Golden State Warriors fan but if they want to have a, like this type of Bulls dynasty they'll that's what they'll do is have your 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 big time players get paid less so you can build that type of team. You know, it, you know, and, and so, but I, I think that the way it turns out, you know, if Scotty makes less money throughout the 90s, you get to have your Ku coach and you get to have your Rodman and it's like, wow, like now you've got this, now you've really got a, you know, a powerful team here. Um, 
And so to, to answer your other question about him kind of holding off, and, and it was 98, right, where he holds off until like November, December to sign the contract um, or, or even later. You know what? If I, you know, if you're balancing the needs of the team and, and the, the needs of the individual, I don't blame Scotty for that. I know that Jordan does, but I think by that point, you've won five championships. You have the, you have your right to you to take your time, wait, get healthy, and do what you need to do. You know, I don't, I don't blame Scotty for his actions in '98 uh, for just holding off. No. No, you know, but uh, but I do think that he should, in terms of that last shot, especially since in 94, I mean, the shot went in. If the shot doesn't go in, he gets to walk around for the rest of his life going, see, you should have given me the ball, <laughs> but Coach made the shot, um, yeah. and, you know. So that's my that's my take. And, and it's funny, even though I was a Nick fan at the time, I I I would have loved to have seen you know Scotty you know go up against the Houston Rockets in '94 and you know possibly Pippen yeah. winning a ring without Jordan. Uh, I, I, oh. I I think I think it would have been really cool. But you know, let, let's just end the video like this. The, the the biggest what if in NBA history is what if the Bulls have played the Rockets? How, how does that play out? Yeah. You know, ha- Hakeem is different because. I know. You know, Bill Cartwright cannot guard Hakeem Olajuwon. The Rockets owned the Bulls during the first three-peat. I mean, how, how, how do you think that would have played out? I, I just think because Jordan was so burned out mentally and physically, um, you know, I, I, I just feel like the motivation level really wasn't there. You, you can't prepare to play the Rockets in the finals because you don't know who's going to meet in the finals. I think if Jordan knew Hakeem was going to meet him in the finals, I, maybe he would have been a little bit more motivated um, but you don't. But the NBA, you don't. You don't know. This is not WrestleMania where we could book the main event of the finals a year in advance. So, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, how, how do you how do you think if say Jordan did meet Hakeem in the finals, uh, how do you think that would have played out? With the Jordan Pippen um, Paxson Horace Grant. Yeah, let's let's just say the '94 Bulls with Jordan have met uh, had have beat the Knicks and 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 and, and went back to the finals. And if Jordan's still on a team, Jordan's still on the team in 94, and, and you're saying, you know, there's, you know, like, I've got to pick one. Just knowing what I know, I would really need to look at that Halajuwon that year, that 94 Rockets again. But you know what? Because you have Jordan on that other team, I've got to pick the Bulls. I'm going to pick the Bulls because that just that, he's just that X factor of, like, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fucking let somebody take my. And that, like that. that that's, that's and I guess we can end the video with this. Like that's that's the, the great thing about Jordan, and and maybe maybe Pippen took some criticism because he wasn't able to elevate his game the same way Jordan did during the finals. It seemed like Jordan got better as the playoffs went on. It seemed like he he found ways to get in extra conditioning, extra training, find extra motivation. Even the thing with Drexler, where he, he he used it to his advantage and just said, "I'm going to destroy this guy," went out and destroyed him. So I I yeah, I could agree with you. I I think you know the challenge of playing Hakeem. Maybe maybe he does step up his game to the next level, and you know may, maybe Phil comes up with a great defensive plan, and they limit Hakeem uh, right. in a way that the Knicks weren't able yeah. to do. That that made the difference against Ewing. Ewing wasn't able to guard Hakeem. That was the difference in that series. You know, Starks was terrible in Game Seven, but you know, it, it's always going to be a big what if. And 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 looking back on it, I I wish we had seen it. And I would have loved to have seen the the Bulls play the Spurs too with with the young Tim Duncan and David Robinson. I thought that that would have been awesome. But you know that that's that's the great thing about sports. You know, you you don't always get. Uh, you know some of the dream matchups yeah. that you want to see. You know, it's just you just gonna keep yeah. wondering. But yeah, man, I I I didn't knew I didn't know it ate at Jordan so much that he didn't get to try for a seventh championship. It's almost like he feels he feels just as bad about not trying as opposed to losing. So I, I it, it it kind of it kind of ate me alive to heard that to hear yeah. that it's eating him alive as a Jordan fan. It kind of makes me wow. feel like man. Ah. I wish we could just take a time warp and go back in the time and go back to 1999. But, uh, all right, yeah, man, we'll, we'll wrap it up, man. Th- th- thanks, for, thanks for doing this with me, man. I'll, I'll let you have the final word. I, I, I was just going to say, I definitely don't think they would have won eight in a row. 
And, you know, if he never retires the first or second time, I don't think they win eight in a row. But, but that's, but you know, I think, like you said, that's the fun thing about sports and the wrap it up. Just for my wrap up, I hope that like you get get Kenny Smith. And get, you know, Jordan seems to be pretty friendly with, you know, talking through Skype or Zoom right now. Get Kenny Smith, get Jordan, Halajuwon if you can, and try to get these guys. You're never going to get Tim Duncan because he's off, I don't know, he's off, you know, writing a book somewhere that no one will ever read. I, I don't know where Tim Duncan, he doesn't do social media. <laughs> but um, get uh, maybe Popovich, get those guys to, you know, try to, you know, weigh in on that. Maybe like a, um, a last dance you know, post conversation, not a documentary, but just like a, a post conversation, because I think that's the, the the what if with the Rockets and the Bulls. Oh yeah, I think that would be that would be that would be awesome. Um, that that would be really good. Um, um, and and it, it's funny. I think I was watching a video. I, I follow a, a, a YouTuber called Sness Drunk. It's Super NES Drunk. And he was talking about athletes in video games that were just too powerful in the game. Uh, like uh, Bo, if you play Bo Jackson in, uh, I think, in Tecmo Bowl for the NES, like you can't tackle him. He could just touch down every time because they made they just gave Bo Jackson like 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 he made it like Game Genie. Like you just couldn't stop him. But they did the same thing with Akeem Olajuwon in like NBA Live '94 or something like that. Or at Live 94, at Live 95. Um, like, you can't stop. Akeem can just dunk at will. Like, nobody can, can stop him. And so it would be it'd be interesting. Who knows? Maybe we'll see, like, 94 Bulls with Michael Jordan versus 94 uh, Rockets. And just I, I just want to see that conversation happen between some of those Rockets players and some of the Bulls players and see what they say. I think that's, I haven't seen that. I don't think you've seen that yet. I think that's, that's the, the next thing for us to see. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just get him in the room and let them just argue it out. Um, but, <laughs> but, 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 but yeah, man, uh, no, th- th- thanks for doing this. And, um, you know, I, I hope it was therapeutic for you. I know this is a, you know, it's a challenging time for everybody now, but, um, but, but yeah, man, th- thanks. Thanks for doing this. I'll, I'll end the video now. All right, guys, th- thanks, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the video.